All right, so uh, let's um, carry on a little bit. We still have a little bit to do on the uh, Anapanasati Sutta. So now we're coming to the last four stages, the last tetrada of the Sutta. And this is equivalent to Dhamma Nupasana uh, in uh, the Satipatthana Sutta. So let's have a quick look at this. We oh, already finished. They practice like this. I will breathe in, observing impermanence. They practice like this. I will breathe out, observing impermanence. They practice like this. I will breathe in, observing fading away. This is Viraga again. They practice like this. I will uh, breathe out, observing fading away. They practice like this. I will breathe in, observing cessation. They practice like this. I will breathe out, observing cessation. They practice like this, I will breathe in, observing, letting go. They practice like this, I will breathe out, observing, letting go. This is equivalent to the Dhamma Nupasana. And uh, so here you can see that you are moving into the terrain of insight. Yeah, It's all about getting insight into things. Uh, cessation, fading away, impermanence, etc. And uh, so this is a different, a little bit different from what we have seen so far. We have kind of taken the samadhi all the way to the jhana stage, to the moche and chittang. And now what we're doing is we're contemplating. So what exactly are we contemplating? It doesn't really say, right? It doesn't say what we are supposed to contemplate. We are observing impermanence. Which, what impermanence are we observing? Which cessation are we observing? It's not at all obvious, or maybe it is reasonably obvious, because I think the obvious thing that you are contemplating is the process that happened just before. Yeah, you went through 12 stages, or if you didn't go through all the 12, at least you went through 10 or 8 or 6 or whatever. So you have some kind of data on which you, on which you can actually do the observing. Yeah? And that is the data, is the process of the peace, and the calming of the mind. And now you look back and you observe that process of the calming of the mind. Yeah, this is kind of where you get this, uh, uh, you, you apply this observation, if you like. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the, the deeper that process goes, if you take it all the way to the 12 stages, the more powerful the insight is going to be. Uh, but you can gain a little bit of insight, even if it goes not all the way to the end. And uh, this is here is very similar to what I was uh, mentioning before. At the end of each meditation, you reflect back on what happened, yeah, what has disappeared, what you have let go of, these kind of things. And this is similar to this kind of thing that I'm that this, this sutta is talking about. Yeah, you take every opportunity, every time you meditate, to try to look back and see what's happening. Yeah? And you may may not feel that you don't get too much out of it, but at least you get used to a way of looking. Yeah? And the deeper the meditation is, the more obvious it will be that uh, uh, what you are seeing, yeah, it will be kind of become clear what is going on, uh, things disappearing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is what this really, this is what this is about, uh, yeah. So uh, observing impermanence, anicca. So you look back on the process you have been through, uh, and so you see that through that process, uh, things are impermanent, things are changing all the time, uh, yeah. Nothing is really steady, and uh, that kind of basic idea of things not being steady. Or always moving, something's arising, something's passing away. That is the idea of impermanence, just things being changing in the kind of broader sense of the term. But um, the idea of impermanence itself has many degrees. Yeah, There are degrees of impermanence. There's the basic idea of just change, which is not very profound. But then there is impermanence that has a certain direction to it. Uh, and that is what is meant by fading away. Fading away is a di certain direction of impermanence. Uh, yeah, something fades away means that uh, uh, there's less and less of it, uh, and that it means impermanence has a direction. Sometimes impermanence just goes up and down, up and down. But here, impermanence goes kind of fading away one particular direction. Uh, yeah. So when you look back on your experience, uh, you look back on the body. Uh, uh, the body is fading away, becoming less and less problematic. Uh, you have less and less experience of the body. This is the fading away of the body. Uh, and then comes the last one here, the cessation. The cessation is the highest kind of impermanence. Uh, 
because then things disappear completely. So the body, first of all, the body is impermanent. Yeah, the breath is kind of doing various things. Then the breath and the body fade away, and eventually it ceases. These are the degrees of impermanence that happen. And you can see that in reality yeah, as you go through the meditation experience. You see this happening. Yeah? You see this happening with the breath. Yeah? You see it happening with the five senses. Yeah? The five senses are becoming weaker and weaker and weaker as you go through this. Yeah? Well, your eyes are probably gone already. You're not seeing a thing. And smelling and, and, and the tasting is not really there. Yeah? But the hearing and the body can still be there for quite a long time afterwards. Yeah? And so you can see uh, the hearing and the body, yeah, they uh, fade away, uh, changing, fading away, and then eventually disappearing completely when you enter the jhana state. Uh, and the more they fade away, the closer they are to cessation, uh, the more insight you can get into what is going on. Uh, you can see the fading away, see these things disappearing. Uh, then so that is like just the, the body and the five senses. Like it's kind of, kind of like the rupa, yeah? And then you have the, uh, uh, the, the will is not a very, very obvious one. Yeah, how you become more and more peaceful and more and more still. Huh? And the more peaceful and still you are, that is the fading away of the will. Yeah, the will is fading away. The chaitanya is fading away. Intentions, all of these things. Huh? And uh, so uh, you can see that also gradually until it ceases completely. When you enter the jhana, it's a completely solid state of experience. And so there's no will there anymore. Huh? Uh, especially in the second jhana, but also mostly in the first jhana as well. Uh, feelings, uh, certain feelings disappearing. Uh, the further down this path you go, the less painful feelings there are. Yeah, there's very little painful feelings when you get to just the minor. Be, it can sometimes there can be a few things that are not. You maybe you hear something and you don't want to hear something. You can perceive that as unpleasant or coarse or something. Uh, but essentially, the all the painful feelings are disappearing. Uh, and you can see and you can start to understand what painful feelings really are the deeper you go. And when you enter the jhanas, they're completely gone. You can see the five hindrances disappearing. Yeah? Your ability to perceive the world, your, the sloth and torpor, the tiredness and lethargy of the mind. The mind becomes brighter and brighter and brighter. And then at the very end, when you enter the jhana, it's completely gone. Only then do you fully know what tiredness and lethargy are. The mind is fully brilliant, fully bright, fully present. Restlessness, same kind of thing. Yeah, the restlessness is very similar to the doing of the mind. So it is very closely related to uh, the activity of the chaitana and the will. Because when there is will, when there's doing, that is equivalent to restlessness. Uh, mind becoming more and more peaceful. Uh, restlessness completely gone when you enter the jhana. Uh, doubt, no more doubt. You know, absolutely sure that the jhana is a wholesome state of mind. You have no doubt about that. Uh, because uh, why? Well, you just know this is a whole simple state of mind. It's kind of obvious. Uh, and uh, so that's what happens as you go through these things. Uh, perceptions are fading away. Yeah? Perceptions in the beginning, you can still perceive things through the five senses. You can still perceive the mind moving, varieties in the mind. Uh, and then perceptions get simplified more and more and more. Uh, more and more, it just becomes the bliss. Uh, less and less the breath. Uh, and eventually, when you enter jhana, all that remains is the perception of bliss. Uh, there's nothing else happening in your mind. Uh, all, everything else is gone. Uh. So what you are doing here, in a sense, is that you are contemplating the five khandhas. Uh, yeah? Because the five khandhas, well, that is what we always experience. Uh, right now, you experience five khandhas. When you meditate, you experience the five khandhas. Uh, and so you're here seeing the gradual disappearance of the five khandhas, uh, or at least parts of them. Uh, and you're eventually seeing the cessation of aspects of the five khandhas. This is how you contemplate the five khandhas. Yeah, it's often one of these um, strange things. You read the sutta, as it says, you should contemplate the khandhas, and people don't know what they're supposed to do. And uh, basically, this is what you, what you do, because everything uh, is five khandhas, uh, ultimately, one way or another. Uh, same thing with consciousness. Ultimately, as well, as you go deeper and deeper in a meditation, you abandon consciousness. Uh, consciousness of the mind is all that remains after a while. Uh, yeah? These things are disappearing as well. Uh, and you start to understand the nature of consciousness uh, as a consequence. Uh, so this is uh, how this works. Um,
So let's come to the very last one. So these are the uh, 15. Let's come to the very last stage. Uh, the last one is a practice like this. I will breathe in, observing, letting go. The practice like this, I will breathe out, observing, letting go. And so this is when you see cessation of things, when you see that long time, you start to let go of these things completely. In other words, you lose all interest in them. Uh, you lose desire and craving for the five khandas because you see that they are, they can cease, they come to an end, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. So this is kind of the letting go process happening at the very end. So this is, uh, this is the... Um, impermanence side uh, but of course what is interesting here is that when you see impermanence fully as we have been talking about uh, in the uh, uh, before uh, you also understand dukkha uh, you see that things disappear they are impermanent they kind of um, vanish for you and you feel much more happy because they are gone uh, and then you start to understand the dukkha nature of these things uh, the more things that disappear the happier you are so all of those things that are gone they must be problematic in a certain way. Yeah? So this is kind of how you, um, how you understand dukkha as a consequence of the impermanence. You're seeing all these things just going, gone, and you're very happy because of that. And then when you enter the jhana states, then the, the non-self nature of these things also becomes very obvious. Because in the jhana state, you no longer have access to these things, no longer have access to the body, no longer have access to the five senses. And that lack of access means that it is non-self, because access is one of the definitions of a self. Yeah, you can manipulate, you can do something with it. If you can't do anything with it, then by definition it is non-self. So you really start to abandon the body, abandon the five senses when you get into these deep stages of uh, samadhi, especially the jhanas, because uh, you understand that you have gone beyond them completely. So... Uh, this is the uh, Dhamma Nupassana. So it relates directly to the last, tet last of the four Satipatthana practices, Dhamma Nupassana. And uh, what you will see is that in the Dhamma Nupassana, it is very much, it is quite similar to this. The two main aspects of Dhamma Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the last of the tetrads, uh, the uh, uh, two main ones is the contemplation of the five hindrances uh, and the contemplation of the seven factors of awakening. Uh, the other ones are much less interesting because it turns out they only exist in the Pali, they don't exist in other traditions. Uh, and so the, uh, the main ones are the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. Uh, and the way they are described in the Satipatthana Sutta is that they are described as uh, uh, understanding First of all, what they are, yeah, the five hindrances, uh, understanding how they arise, uh, how they are let go of, uh, and how they don't arise again in the future. And yeah, so this idea of letting go of them and not arising in the future, well, that is basically understanding the impermanence of these things, uh, very similar to what we are seeing here. So you, are, so you can see the, the connection here to Dhamma Nupassana and this last, last uh, uh, tetrad of Anapanasati. And also a similar kind of thing with the uh, Satta Sambhujanga. It talks about the Sambhujanga as the factors of awakening in terms of what they are, how they come to be, and how they are strengthened and maintained in the future. So it has to do with causality, with how things are impermanent, how they change, how they come to be, especially the five hindrances. It is very clear that it is very closely related to what you see here. So again, these things are two different ways of thinking about the same thing. But it is very, I think, important and useful to know that the main aspect of uh, uh, the Satipatthana uh, in the Sutta is the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening, uh, and not the other parts. Uh, and then you can start to see the connection here quite easily uh, about what is going on. Uh. So... Um, uh, Yes, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's just do the summary verse at the very end. Mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated in this way, is very fruitful and very beneficial. And as you remember when we started out, uh, it said at the very beginning uh, that uh, it uh, leads you all the way to awakening if you do this in the right way. Uh, that is kind of the, uh, the uh, powerful thing about this particular kind of contemplation uh.
So uh, instead of starting a new topic now, I think uh, let us just do a little bit of meditation again uh, and have a bit more discussion and we can start a new topic just after, after that. I think that's probably a better idea. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Any more uh, discussion points? Uh, anyone have? Does it make sense? Yeah, makes sense. You sure? Yeah. Not too confused. Uh, sometimes people are so confused, don't know what to ask. Uh, <laughs> that's the downside. You are, especially if you are a newcomer, it can be difficult. Uh, but. Uh, so, uh, hmm. Please, uh, yeah. Yeah, the Ajahn, we got a question on Nimita. I was wondering what is it and how important is it? And uh, is it just a bright brown light? Uh, if it is just a brown, right brown light, it probably can be obtained by just focusing on the blind disc for a long time and close your eye and your mind will appear with a blind disc. So I, I wonder what, what yeah. is it all yeah. about? Yeah, sure. But well, it is, uh, what it is about, it's about the, uh, uh, something that appears when the mind has certain qualities. Uh, but the qualities of mind are more important than the light. Uh, and I think this is why the Buddha, when he talks about meditation, he doesn't normally talk about these nimittas. He talks about the qualities that you acquire instead. And this is what you see here in this particular case. Mostly it talks about happiness and talks about the stillness of the mind. In the next sutta, we're going to have a look at it in a second. It's exactly the same. There's two qualities you see again and again. is the tranquility of the mind and the bliss of the mind. And those are the, really the, if you like, the salient features, the important features of the mind that, that this make you decide whether you are on the right track or not. And so if the nimitta appears in that kind of, that kind of context, uh, then it is the real thing. It is the real kind of thing. Uh, but as you say, you can look at this lamp, yeah, and after a while you kind of see, you see an nimitta in your mind just by looking at that one. Uh, or as I said, some people have very powerful creative minds. Some people have very visual minds. Uh, and they will see lights even without meditation. They close their eyes. They can see anything they want in the, in the mind. Uh, and so the importance is the uh, uh, concomitant uh, Factors that come together with that uh, nimitta is what matters. Uh, is the nimitta absolutely necessary? I don't, mm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it's not talked about that much in the suttas. Uh, so it's not the kind of the core part of the Buddhist teachings, uh, but yet it is there sometimes. Uh, so I think it may be the, at least the standard way that this, these things tend to happen and the way the mind uh, goes. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, the, the word nimitta itself, as I said, in the, uh, the way it is used in the suttas, uh, it is used more like a foundation or basis uh, for meditation. Uh, so often it has the kind of similar to the idea of uh, basically an object uh, as such. Uh, uh, the way it is used very much in contemporary meditation circle is used as any kind of image that arises in the mind. Uh, so sometimes they will talk about nimitta as like you. You know, you see, I don't know, people see all kinds of things in meditation. Sometimes they see kind of heavenly realms or hell realms, something like that. Uh, sometimes there are stories about monks taking you on a tour through the heavens and the hells. Uh, so you kind of, you tune your mind in and they kind of take you, take you to these realms. Uh, so that can be called an imita because it is a vision that you have yeah, as you go. But uh, if, for the samad, what we're talking about here is a very specific kind of thing, which is bright, powerful, interesting, beautiful, blissful, still, uh, uh, has all of these kind of qualities. Uh. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Ajahn, you always ask us to reflect uh, and review at the end of the meditation or towards the end of the meditation. Mm. And uh, I think you're the only one that, that seems to emphasize that quite a bit at the end of the meditation to do a review. And uh, that's, that's quite nice. But... Uh, what do we review then? <laughs> do we review the mind? How was it? Do we review what went well, what didn't go well? Or do we review both? Or, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, uh, the best time to review is if in meditation, if you're having a bit of success, yeah, because then you can kind of you, you can ask yourself, why did I have success? And that is the best thing to review because. Uh, 
first of all, the mind is more powerful, so you have more ability to review when the more mind is more powerful. Uh, and secondly, you can then review those qualities, that thing that give rise to success, because we all want to have success in meditation. Uh, and so what you review then is you review uh, these factors, uh, you know, you ask yourself, why did I have success? And, and what you will see is that uh, you, you started out probably with certain qualities in the mind. Yeah, You didn't have too much uh, defilements present. Uh, uh, and uh, so you know kind of the initial conditions that when you started out, uh, you know a little bit about letting go. How did the letting go happen? Because good meditation is always the outcome of letting go. What, how did the letting go happen? Uh, and very often what you will realize is that letting go may be quite different from what you think it is. Uh, Letting go sometimes actually means just relaxing properly yeah, for the first time. Uh, you actually really are enjoying just being here and being present and, and actually allowing things to be. Normally, we don't allow things to be. So you actually start to understand what this letting go is. Uh, and it may be quite, it often is quite different from what we think it is. Uh. The third thing that you review are the perceptions that you use in your meditation. Uh, what did I do to get this started? What did I how did I perceive things as I set out? And you will see things like I had a perception of, uh, you know, being in a good place. I had some positive perception about the, my life, about what I have lived or whatever. Some, some kind of gladness or underlying positivity that was there as you were meditating. Uh, or maybe you have a sense that you have enough of the world. So you kind of <laughs> reject the world a little bit. So you start to understand the uh, the, the meaning of these particular words that we use all the time and to see how it functions in your mind and how it then leads to good meditation. Usually it's very simple. Yeah? Or very often when we talk about meditation, everything can seem so complicated. Huh? We just spent how much, almost a whole day just discussing the Anapanasati Sutta and it can seem very complicated, so many things. Huh? But actually the experience itself is usually very simple. Huh? And very easy and very straightforward once you understand it. Uh, and there's always a danger when you talk too much about these things that you uh, destroy the uh, experience because you end up thinking too much about it or you have too much anticipations or you make you complicate something that actually is really, really simple and straightforward. Uh, so these are just indications. Yeah. And uh, then you, when you come to the experience, you start to understand how it all kind of fits together. Something like that is what I would recommend. And even Ajahn Brahm, I, I learned this idea of uh, contemplating meditation actually from Ajahn Brahm. He used to teach this as well, in the, especially in the old days. I'm not sure what he says these days. So, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so we review the, uh, the positive one, right? The, the successes. And not, so, okay, not, so yeah, I forgot to talk about so the, neg the, the negative one. The other side, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we well, don't have a good... You know, don't have a good time. Then what do we do? Do we do review that? Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, you say why, 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 why was it so miserable this time? Uh, what is the cause of misery? <laughs> it's good to know the cause of misery as well, right? Uh, and sometimes it's kind of flat and boring. What happened this time? Uh, not really sure. Uh, one of the things that you will see in your meditation is that it's important to be in the right mood when you start out. Uh, it is important to be a bit inspired. Uh, so one of the nice things to do. That's that's why guided meditations can be nice because. Uh, if you are in a place that doesn't remind you of meditation, like you are in your house or whatever, and maybe the kind of all that familiarity around, it doesn't really remind you of meditation. So you need something to remind you of the qualities of meditation. And that can just be the voice of another person. If there's someone you really respect for the Dhamma qualities, like, I don't know who, Ajahn Brahm or whatever, you listen to Ajahn Brahm, and just the voice of Ajahn Brahm is enough to kind of put you in that mood, yeah, the mode of meditation. That is one of the ways of using a guided meditation to put you in that kind of a, a space where it actually works. And so that is one of the things, because sometimes the mind is just doesn't really, it's not really interested, yeah? it doesn't really want to go there or whatever. So, um, yeah. Anyone else want to say anything here? Please don't be afraid of asking here. I, you will not be told off if you have, <laughs> and have any, whatever the question is, it's fine. Huh? Um, so, sorry, Ajahn, yeah. it's me here again, because yeah. I didn't see any raised hands. If any Kalyan Mittal wants to ask the question, please go ahead, and I can ask later. <laughs> so I don't want to take away this opportunity. Uh, but if no one has a question, then I would like to avail this time. I can take the floor is yours, Lena, so go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Very quickly, Ajahn. Um, the last tetra, is that equivalent to um, 
kind of progression from second to fourth jhana one uh and secondly because we are uh, um, we are beyond five senses now yeah. so at least one khanda is out of the way so when you say the impermanence um and appreciating appreciating the uh fading away cessation and letting go that is of feelings perceptions intentions and ultimately the awareness um in reality how does one really perceive the impermanence of feelings at that time do you really have any feelings at that that time except for joy and bliss so you're kind of thinking okay this is also impermanent or not thinking like perceiving this also i'm i'm not really very sure okay. what All happens right. in the last tetrad okay so the uh, so, so the you the last tetrad happens when you come out of your meditation afterwards uh, yeah and so you review what happened before i i during the meditation so you come out of it you come to the end of it and then you review it uh, and so for that reason you can also review the body you can review all, all five khandas uh, because you see like the disappearance of the body disappearance of the five senses uh. so this is kind of a post uh, thing uh, it, it, because jhanas can only be reviewed especially especially jhanas after you come out of them after you come out of these these deep things uh. um feelings you can cultivate in two different ways one way is to look at the um, feelings that are gone and have disappeared yeah some feelings will no longer be there like the painful feelings happy feelings are always changing so some of the happy feelings will be gone especially as you go through the jhanas it will some will have some will appear some will disappear and you move on uh, that is one way of doing it seeing the changeability and disappearance some and then because all that remains in the jhana experience uh, we can then contemplate the feeling in the jhana as well this and this is often very powerful uh, because you can see that when you enter the jhana this feeling arises when you come out it disappears uh, So that very feeling you have in jhana itself is uh, dependent on cause and conditions it depends on the causes of the arising of jhana and then what stops when you come out of it uh, that is where the enlightenment experience can happen yeah because when you can see that that very feeling is unreliable and uncertain uh, and there is nothing else to hold on to in the world uh, because the other feelings have already been abandoned uh, and that is where kind of very profound experiences can happen and this is the kind of the power of the jhana experience with the jhanas you Uh, the, the, what remains of the world is very tightly focused in one point. Uh, just the bliss, just the happiness of the jhana experience. Uh, everything else is gone. Uh, so all you have to understand impermanence of that little bit, and then everything is gone. Uh, that's kind of how you, you know, how you make a very profound insights. Uh, you become a stream mentor, or whatever. So, so the awareness also dis. I mean, you can contemplate the awareness also disappeared during the third tetrad. Like, does does that also go away? Do you feel that that's also lacking or that's still there because you're now in the fourth tetra okay. you're actually thinking you're aware yeah so what what happens with the awareness or the consciousness is that consciousness happens gets lost in degrees yeah so the first thing that happens is that the, the six classes of consciousness the five classes of consciousness the five senses that is gone when you go into the jhana so you can see that it's all gone it's appear that is kind of a foundation of understanding the consciousness and then as you practice the jhanas again parts of mind consciousness disappear mm -hmm. and then also you understand that the um, the very jhana itself is a is a phenomenon that is caused by cause and conditions by your volition you you uh, it arises because you are inclining your mind in a certain direction when it's finished it comes out so or everything within the jhana the awareness the perception the feeling everything that, that is there uh, mm -hmm. you see it as impermanent because of coming going in and going out of it uh, So uh this is just the culmination of first jhana like uh, or because you've reached the your liberating is it equivalent to the tranquility or equanimity of the fourth jhana like where does it all fit in between the rest of the jhanas i mean the rest of the jhana well it's just the rest of the jhanas are just uh, if the mind is not powerful enough in the first jhana you go to the second jhana it creates a more powerful mind for one so it has more ability to uh you know to reflect properly it is more stable uh, the fourth jhana is called the anandja that's where the becomes impenetrable uh, so it becomes fully stable and that's why the fourth jhana is kind of the ideal stage for insight because the mind is impenetrable so sometimes you have to go all the way to the fourth jhana but you also gain insight just by moving to the higher jhanas because you're abandoning things you, you're abandoning you know chunks of uh, the mind consciousness uh, and that the muscle mind consciousness is kind of being simplified and abandoning things so you gain insight into the nature of mind consciousness itself by abandoning bits and pieces of it uh, So you go higher and higher you understand more about what is given up and you also empower the mind which also enables more insight. 
But, but this last tetrad is actually yeah. you've come out of the tetrad, isn't yeah. it? You've come out and you can actually yeah. experience the body as yeah. well. So yeah. like yeah. you're yeah. still progressing on if you want to do uh, further jhanas. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so so the, the last step is the more trying to liberating the mind. Yeah, that includes all four jhanas. Yeah. I just ask one question. Yes. I think someone was uh, asking about the dangers of this yeah. ninitas as well. I think I read in a uh, book, yeah. Main Chi Q or something, that when you get into these yeah. states, you sometimes can have psychic powers. Or I mean, is that? Do you have any comments on that? Like, is that something <laughs> we should worry about? Or worry about psychic powers? Won't right? even go yeah, I I wouldn't be too. To worry. And usually, when you come to this stage, your mind is very powerful and you will be able to deal with anything psychic phenomena that arise. You're able to deal with it usually. It's not a big deal eh? because your mind is strong. You're just, you're just kind of interesting. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I can you know, see weird stuff and see various realms or whatever. It's kind of just a bit of fun. Yeah? <laughs> I think one of the things is that when we do meditation practice, we should also have a bit of fun sometimes, you know, just enjoy what's happening here. And sometimes when you see kind of strange visions and what things in meditation, it's very common when you get to this stage. You can see some people see lots of visions at this point. Uh, and so you just play around with it for a while and see what happens. Uh, and then after a while, and if you don't want to play around with it, if you don't enjoy it, it probably won't arise for you anyway. Uh, you probably go straight to Nimitas and straight into Samadhi because you're not interested in it. Uh, so it depends on the inclination of your mind, what kind of person you are. Okay. I think hearing from you, you know, it's reassuring. It depends yeah. what is your your mind, like, like if I like I have anxiety or I worry a lot, so yeah. when I hear these kind of things, and yeah. actually I did experience, but not nimitas, but even rapture, like very strong rapture, already yeah. scare me. I mean, like you know, because it's not something you have experienced before. Right. Yeah. It feels yeah. very overwhelming. It feels very overwhelming. So actually, yeah. I noticed yeah. I actually pull back from that. You know, yeah. even that also I pull back already. So yeah. because you never experienced before. So yeah. 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 This it's good to yeah. know. Yeah. Absolutely. These are very powerful things, yeah, and because they're very powerful, they do feel very overwhelming, yeah. But in the end, what you're giving up is dukkha anyway, so it's not so, being overwhelmed may not be a bad thing, you see. <laughs> so that's the thing, yeah. Okay, great.